Hiring the wrong executive costs you time and money. Leveraging work psychology, Spear Consulting helps you hire the right executive so you can focus on growing your business. For a free quote, visit spiritmco.com. Enjoy the show. Fernando G. Little from Atrium Health. So, uh, so really honored and excited to be able to have you on the Virtuous Heroes podcast. For those of our listeners that aren't familiar with your background, can you tell us who you are? Absolutely. Thank you, Christopher. Glad to be here. I proudly serve as the Chief Diversity Officer for Atrium Health. I also serve as the Minister of Music for my church in St. Mark's. I also um, am a proud father, a proud husband, and I'm also a member of several nonprofit boards and an active alumnus of Appalachian State University. Uh, So that's pretty much a handful. All right. Well, Minister of Music, I got to I got to ask you about that because my wife and I are actually the praise and worship leaders for a school of supernatural ministry in Chicago called the Anointed Life. Oh, wow. We have got like 140 members uh, in the school and they're all over the world. Um, So so I play guitar. Hannah sings. I also do some, you know, uh, I I'm a better guitarist than a singer, but I, you know, I do my part to uh, lift my heart to the Lord and he blesses it. Um, But yeah. So tell me about the, about your role at church. That's awesome. Wow. Wow. Well, I mean, so many similarities, Chris. Um, So I actually serve along with my wife. We uh, lead the music ministry at at, at my church in in Charlotte. It's St. Mark's United Methodist Church. So we have about maybe 300, 400 members. Um, So it's not a huge church, but, but, but it's definitely, um, a, a great church family. And, and she and I started serving together when we met in college. So my wife and I are college sweethearts. And mm-hmm. we had this opportunity to uh, be student directors of the gospel choir at our at our college, right? And, um, and so there was this time where you had to audition for it. And, and then the um, director and professor of the choir would select the student directors. And I brought a skill set of actually being able to play. So I play, you said you play guitar. I play piano, keyboard, organ, and um, um, had, had taken lessons. And, and there's a whole story with that. Um, and, but my wife was the minor in voice, and she sings much better than me. So I think we didn't check two boxes completely because I wasn't the vocalist that she was, but she wasn't the musician that I was. So he hired both of us as co-student directors of the gospel choir, which meant that we had to work together, you know, to to teach music and direct and whatever. But um, that was a ministry that we both felt like brought us together because in college, we were so passionate about the gospel choir and what it did for the students and the outlet that it was for the students on campus uh, that it brought us closer together and we didn't even realize it. And so uh, before long, we realized that we liked each other. And uh, <laughs> and then, then, then the rest is his. We ended up getting married. And, and then, But our service in music ministry is something that keeps us together. So wherever we've gone in the churches that we serve, we've co-led the music ministry together. So it's, it's something that I wouldn't trade, wouldn't trade for anything. So, yeah. So what does the music ministry look like in particular, Fernando? I'm just curious, like, is it like, you know, uh, modern praise and worship? Is it like old hymns or like, you know, hymns or what? what is it? <laughs> Help me better Good question, Chris. And that's the loaded question. It has to be all of that, right? Okay. Because we we have an obligation to meet the congregation where they are. We have a very diverse congregation in terms of age, in terms of um, uh, race, ethnicity, you know, it's, it's, it's a very diverse congregation. And so it's, it's the tall obligation of the music ministry to try to meet people where they are. So we have some people that appreciate anthems and hymns. And so we have in, in our service um, at least a, an opportunity for us to do anthems and hymns. But um, to your question, we have uh, four major music ensembles within our music ministry. We have an inspirational mass choir that sings all types of uh, genres of gospel music and anthems and hymns. And then we have a male chorus that uh, sings more 
quartet, old traditional, some Southern gospel music. Then we have a youth ensemble. It's called I Praise with the little I, like iPhone, iPad, I Praise. That's mm -hmm. the, I always have to tell people, make sure the I is little. That's what that's for. I Praise is our youth our young people's ensemble, and they like to do contemporary gospel, you know, the um, um, the the upbeat, fun, energetic gospel music. And then we also have a praise team that, that um, you know, is, has the ultimate responsibility of, you know, ushering in the service, ushering in the spirit. And so that's a lot of praise and worship music. Um, and and so I, I'd like to say that we have a pretty diverse a, a diverse uh, repertoire of music, uh, but we, we we pretty much we try to do it all. <laughs> what uh what's feeding you the most in this season, Fernando? Feeding me most in this season right now is that we do get an opportunity to offer that ministry, and it still serves as an outlet for me. So like I don't do it full time. You know, mm -hmm. and so because it's not a full time and, and our church is small enough to where, you know, we can do it uh, on a part time basis. But it's still it, it fills my tank when I see that the ministry, the music ministry is helping to lift the congregation during unprecedented times, during mm -hmm unanticipated times during uncertain times, right? Uh, especially when we were able to figure out how to continue the ministry when, um, at, you know, the beginning of the pandemic, churches were not meeting in person. And I could feel a void with people and not, you know, being able to come into church and, and be inside the sanctuary. So we had to be very creative, even with offering music virtually. And just to know that we were able to meet people even in a virtual environment um, during that time, um, that that filled my tank, Chris, and that was and that was something that that charged me, uh, just to know that our, our our music ministry was keeping people going and encouraged during um, during an unprecedented time of uh, pandemic and, and and other crises that we were dealing with. Gotcha. Yeah, I hear you on the uh, you know the 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 remote praise and worship, and um, you know because that's with with a global audience, that's basically the option that we have, <laughs> and so oh, so right. so it's interesting to 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 do that. Um, but like, just uh, I had a a birthday party uh, uh, two weekends ago, and we had a five. I was playing guitar, wife was singing, we had another guitarist and singer, a bassist and a and a drummer on my deck and just being oh. able to praise with, you know, all of our loved ones together. Um just there is something special though about leaving the the virtual element to being able to be in person together, yeah. especially as it relates to praise and worship and and you know being together for church services. I mean, it's hard to it's hard to, you know, put it into words, but I also wanted to affirm what you were saying about, you know, just being able to like help people enter into prayer in that way. Yeah. In that, like, I, I find like, you know, when people, you know, are able to share, like, you know, while you were worshiping, like, I feel like I went to a, a new level of like intimacy with God yeah. during like, you know, um, during the worship or, or like they, you know, experiencing the Holy spirit through the praise and worship, um, it's that type of stuff that you're like, you know, sometimes it's, you know, especially on a volunteer basis, not always easiest in order to coordinate musicians calendars and do all Absolutely. that work, Absolutely. but uh, just being able to be so fulfilled, not only with just being able to worship God in that way, but also, you know, as it's making an impact into people's spiritual lives, I think that is well yeah. worth the, the work that needs to be done in that way. Well said, Chris. And I, and I think we have to lead by example, right? So even in our worship, even though we're leading and, and we may be focused on some technicalities of three-part harmony or four-part harmony, or if the drummer's in the pocket or whatever, but I think we have to lead by example to show that we freed ourselves to worship too. And that's 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 what I appreciate about um, our ministry is that as I am leading, I can worship freely myself. So um, it's one of those things that I think we have to keep in mind too. That you know we may be we may be somewhat in charge of the technicalities, but God will bless your purpose. And and if you're if you're right there centered in worship, everything else just works out. You know. 
So I love it. I love it. Well, thank you for, for sharing in that way. And uh, Fernando, um, so chief diversity officer for Atrium Health, that's a, a big gig. Uh, tell us Please. a little bit about how you, you know, got to that leadership position. Tell us a little bit about your journey. Yeah, so this role now sits um, up under our Chief People and Culture Officer, which is our Human Resources Division, with a very close working relationship with our CEO. So it's it's really a twofold journey for me. I, I'll tell you how I got into the HR realm of work, but then I also want to speak to uh, my my pull towards healthcare and what got me what got me to healthcare too. So. The HR side of things is pretty straightforward. Um, I attribute my career pathway being jump started via a program called Inroads, mm -hmm. which was an internship program for rising uh, college freshmen. That um, it started with a pre college component where you got, and, and, and there was it was a target for underrepresented youth in business engineering or STEM careers. And, and it was it was it was a nonprofit organization that recognized that uh, some of the exposure and some of the sponsorship opportunities for underrepresented youth uh, needed to be amplified, needed to be elevated particularly with large companies like Fortune 500 companies. And so uh, inroads would provide the soft skills training for for us, the students. And then once you went through the soft skills training, then you got to interview with these sponsoring companies that had internship opportunities. And so I was fortunate enough to be able to interview with Bank of America and um for all four summers of my college career, I had a summer internship in human resources with Bank of America. And so it gave me a very early introduction to the functions of HR. I got a rotational experience. So um, once I was done with college, they offered me a job into human resources. And so that's how I got my jump start in the career of human resources. And then just from there, I was able to um, grow in, in, in roles and, and um, fortunately be promoted. Um, the healthcare piece is a story I want to share with you because that's one more personal one. Uh, it was, um, it started earlier, much earlier. It's right when I first started to walk and be able to walk and talk. I used to go spend the summers with my grandparents um, who lived in Rock Hill, South Carolina. And at the time, I didn't know why this situation was how it was, but I had an aunt who was a quadriplegic that stayed with my grandparents. And part of everyone's role when you stay with my grandparents was to participate in the caretaking of her, you know, making sure that she, you know, was able to eat and, and to feed her, making sure that she was turned in her bed so she didn't get bed sores. Um, I probably was dispensing medicine at a very young age. Probably I wouldn't, shouldn't have been, but I knew how to give her her medicines, you know. And and um, and and that just because I started that so young, it became just a part of my life, you know, the caretaking, the um, caregiving to my aunt, and it was she was someone that we just loved, and and I also saw what that support did for her because. She was very active in the community. She was a vocational rehab counselor um, mm -hmm. in the community. And so she was working with other quadrup quadriplegic patients, uh, just counseling them on their careers or counseling them just in general if they were newly injured or um, <clears throat> if they've been paralyzed their whole life. Um, and I saw what it did for her. It, 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 and that support enabled her to be able to go back to school and get her undergraduate degree. And um, and then she went back to school and got her master's degree. And I'm sitting here going, wow, my eye cannot move from the neck down. And she did all of this, you know, so I should be able to accomplish my goals. And that's what she would always tell me. Fernando, you can, you can do this, you know. And then when I further learned her story, Chris, I learned that she had not been paralyzed her whole life, mm -hmm. that, 
um, when she was 18, she was had just graduated high school. She was in the top 10 percent of her class. She was the homecoming queen. She she was, the you know, Mrs. Student Body, you know, like Miss Popular, you know, and, and she had plans to go to college and um, and aspirations, you know, to pursue a career. And uh, she was working at the mall in Rock Hill, South Carolina. This is where my, my mom and her family's from, Rock Hill, South Carolina. She was working in the mall. To make a long story short, a very troubled and jealous ex-boyfriend showed up to the mall and shot her at work. Mm. And she was rendered uh, paralyzed, you know, from that day forward. And so she um, had to quickly... acquiesce to a new way of living, right? And, and a new lifestyle. And um, and her resolve and her resilience. So the first thing that gets me about her is when I was old enough to talk to her about it, she told me that the biggest thing that she could have done to move forward in her life is forgive him. Mm-hmm. Because if she harbored any resentment against him for the rest of her life, that was always going to be a void and and something, a hurdle, something about that was just always going to be a hurdle for her. And she said she realized that she's going to have to forgive him so that she can move forward. She even had part of his sentencing was the judge said, in addition to the, the time you serve in prison, you're going to have to write her a check every month for $50. And it wasn't like to pay her for anything, but it was supposed to be a reminder of what to him, of what he did to her and the rendering her. And she told the judge, I don't want that. I don't want that. Don't take that part out of the sentencing. I forgive him. I've, I've moved forward. You know, so then that was big. Then. So forgiveness was huge, you know, and for, for me to see and hear her say that she forgave a man mm. that was so um, hateful and hurtful to her, you know, um, and then sh- her resolve. So she knew she wanted to go to college. She knew that she she was going to be a first generation college student, um, but she had to have a means for it. So two years after being injured, she entered into the Miss Wheelchair South Carolina pageant because it was a scholarship pageant. And she entered now, this woman said she just finished being rehabbed and just, you like, I'm thinking, Chris, it would take me 20 years to just get over being rendered paralyzed. Like, here, she's two years later in this statewide pageant for Miss Wheelchair in South Carolina, and she wins it. Whoa. She wins Miss Wheelchair in South Carolina. And that was her scholarship to be able to go and get her, get her four year degree at Winthrop University. Uh, so, my aunt is was the the living testimony. So she passed away a couple of years ago, but um, she was the living testimony for me that you can forgive and you can do anything that you put your mind to, and and with the right community of support around you, you can do the impossible. You know, and so the fact that she was able to you know, do the things that she did do. Uh, she was very inspirational for, for me. And when my internships, when I got the internship, she bought me my first set of real neckties because up until that point, I was still wearing clip-ons. <laughs> and she was like, Fernando, you're in corporate America. Now, I, uh, I want you to have a tie, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and and she, she brought me my first set of... Uh, of neckties for for an internship, you know, and and so just her, her just kind of stamping that, you know, hey, you can do this, you know, and I'm gonna I'm gonna be here, you know, for you. So that that sort of showed me that a community of support and and making people caring for people and providing the right, you know, uh, services from a healthcare and a health and wellness standpoint um, showed me that what those outcomes could be. Cause I think her outcomes were remarkable. I know that was a long story, Chris, but I just, I wanted to share that. That's, that was kind of my draw to healthcare. Hmm. So, yeah. So no, I just want to just make the prophetic declaration as you're just sharing that Fernando, that, 
you know, if there's anyone listening to this episode today and that they have some unforgiveness on their hearts that Mm -hmm. in Jesus's name that you'll be able to let go. I mean, that is an empower is such a powerhouse story of the testimony of your aunt to, to be able to forgive a guy who paralyzed her. Like I know so many people with significantly less amounts of, of suffering that they face due to, you know, other people's um, anger, frustration, hatred, et cetera. And, you know, have led a life where they haven't been able to forgive in that way. And as you said, like, you know, that she realized that this was going to freeze her in time if she wasn't able to actually let go and to be able to uh, just continue to progress in her own life. So that that's incredible. And the other thing that I think that you, you know, part of that story that was really resonating for me is when I was like in my twenties, I was uh, uh, we were all living in my grandfather's six flat on the South side of Chicago. And my, my grandmother was like at the end of stages with Alzheimer's. And so we all did rotations of, you know, changing diapers, um, helping to take care of her at night. And I think, you know, wow, what, a, what a impactful time in your life to having, you know, had done that at such an early stage, um, that really helped you to kind of be set free from the self-centeredness that so many people are plagued with. <laughs> and, and, um, and, you know, I'm probably the most guilty person of that. Um, and I think about, like how in that time of taking care of grandma Stella, like it was a suffering that I was frustrated about, but I look back at that now and realize how much of a blessing it really was to realize, like to be able to a spend that time with my grandma, but B to be able to help my grandfather who always supported and loved us in that way. And now as a father myself with a 10 and eight year old boys (laughs) that live in a very affluent area. um, And, and sometimes we, you know, as a, as a dad, it's not, it's, it's hard for me to see some of the kind of entitlement that I myself also struggled with, um, you know, growing up, but thinking back to, even as you're sharing this, like it was some of those, you know, uh, little keys open big doors in the kingdom. And, and I think you being able to have to face um, like the real like life and some of those really difficult elements like you for for you and and being able to you know help your aunt with being paralyzed um yeah just thinking about how that was like a a big shift in my own life of helping me to like you know get outside of myself and focus on other people now at the end of the day there was still more in that journey that i've shared on this podcast many times but uh, you know you know thankfully jesus coming to my life and helping me to to learn how to die to self and grow in that way. Yeah. Um, but I also recognize, you know, as I'm just sharing that, I offer that both, you know, just thinking about that for my own kids of like, hey, how can I create these opportunities in order to to give back and to focus on others instead yeah. of being so self-centered? For us that we've, we've fed the homeless, like spontaneous feeding of homeless, like, you know, bringing meals, to the homeless on like, you know, all throughout the city. And that's, that's kind of impacted them, but I think we could do some more of that. Um, But then also just, you know, offering that also for, for the audience too, of recognizing that if you feel like you've been in this place where, where your own heart and you've, you feel like, you know what, I honestly like need to get some more peace or I need to have some more joy. And, and I do feel like even just listening to Fernando's testimony of his own career journey into healthcare, that, you know, one of the best ways to be able to do that is to focus on other people and to, to care and love on um, people that are vulnerable in our society. And, and the way that that just instantly brings joy and peace into your heart. So, so thank you for that reminder as well, Fernando, that's definitely oh, no a powerful story for sure. And thank you for reminding us that you have, you know, two boys that, and, and the, the blessings of being a dad. So I have two sons, too. They are 15 and 19. Mm. And so the same same um, value system that you want to instill in your boys, I try to do the same with them, you know. And um, like you said, there is an entitlement um, factor with them, but we also want them to uh, – you know, embrace 
you know, the gifts that they have and, and, and how they should give, you know, be willing to give those gifts. And, and, you know, I try not to dictate, you know, the manner in which they do, but they know that giving is important in our house and you do have to you do have to give back so you know whether they're doing it through you know ministries at church or you know my oldest son was um a student government leader both of them are avid basketball players you can't tell them that they're not lebron and steph you know and so i'm glad they have that confidence about them themselves but they also um give through uh, community service. So my oldest son was in student government and he was a reading buddy at an elementary school. And I saw um, when it first hit him, the power of sharing his gifts and giving back because he, he grew close to his reading buddy, which was at an underserved elementary school in the city. And, um, and, and they would go every week and read to this um, young, young man. And, um, You know, when you're doing it every week, a lot of times you don't realize the impact. But on his last day of reading with that young man, and he was about to graduate, um, the young man cried. He's like, you mean you're not coming back? (laughs) And Cameron did not realize uh, the impact that he'd had on him. And he he made him a card. The the, the young student made him a card. And and that's when I really realized that he... um, got that intrinsic reward. You know, we were just talking about the intrinsic reward that comes from, that was my first time seeing him react to that, you know? Um, and so we, I try to instill the same in my boys, you know, the importance of giving back and, and the importance of um, realizing that you're, you you know, you're, you're, you're in a blessed situation, um, but there's, there's an obligation to, to pay it forward and to give it back. Um, but I'm also very real about my my sons who are African American gentlemen. You know that um, you know there are going to be some challenges that you face because of uh, just the the history of structural exclusion in in our in our country and in in the workplace and um, and and um, you're you're going to have to be ready to deal with that face on you know head on and you're going to have to have a foundation. Um, that that pulls you through some of those challenges. You know, I pray as a dad that they don't run into those challenges, but mm-hmm. it would be uh, irresponsible of, of of me as their father not to prepare them for it. So um, that's that's something that's very um, important to me that they're not caught off guard in case they have some of those challenges. No one should have to grieve alone. Cassie's Foundation is a community dedicated to supporting you through the loss of your child by offering real support from others who've experienced the same. Go to at Cassie Foundation on Facebook to learn more and consider donating to the Miss Foundation today at MissFoundation.org. Yeah, so, you know, as a chief diversity officer for Atrium Health, you know, I feel like you would have to be living under a rock not to see some of the racial and social justice issues that have been, um, you know, at the at the forefront of of uh, news. And um, just curious, like, how are you guys being able to respond to that at Atrium Health? Um, but then the other thing that's just coming to mind is, you know, just thinking about <laughs> thinking about okay so here here's if i'm just going to be super candid and real like i think about like i'm going to i'm going to do my best to to verbalize this and and uh, do it in a way that's very direct so it's not unclear like i think fernando at a certain level outside all right so so my grandfather rest you know rest in peace uh he was a retired chicago cop and he you know, was a really great man who loved his grandchildren, you know, provided for us throughout our lives, took us to hockey games, like had like that loving component. And as a retired Chicago cop, I think, um, I don't know, I, I, you know, I don't think I was mature enough in my life when he was alive to be able to ask him like, well, grandpa, you know, you have got a lot of things that you say that are racist. So can you help me understand like, why are you racist? You know, like, is it from your experience on the job? Is it racism because of like, that's what your parents brought you up into, et cetera. Um, And I think that 
for me, like as growing up as a youth, some of that stuff like had kind of affected me in a way too. In addition to the fact that growing up the only Hispanic in an all white neighborhood um, also like almost got to this point where like, you know, if people are making fun of me. I realized that if I could get on their side and make fun of myself before like the joke, before I became the butt of the joke, then in essence, like I was able to kind of like blend in with them instead of like taking, you know, some of that, that hatred and, and, and discrimination um, against Hispanics. And um, so I think about that and how that in my own heart, I know this is probably not going to be the easiest answer. <laughs> so this it just preparing you for that. But yeah, thinking about like how in my own journey, it's been Christ who has allowed me to heal that inner healing of some of those wounds. And now looking at it, like in our statistics of the way that we operate as a company, a lot like, like everyone's like, well, how, like, why are you so kind of like just openly loving to all people? And oftentimes like, you know, in my mind, I'm like, well, you know, the, the, the outspoken public answer to that is like, we, you know, we're a value-based organization, mission-based, and we want to love all people in that way. And we value relationships and realize like by being able to bring diversity, equity, and inclusion to the work that we're doing, we help our organizations to be able to be more creative in that way. But I think the non-public answer is that like, I see everyone as brothers and sisters in Christ and therefore they're my siblings. And so I treat them accordingly. But it, it was from that, that basically has allowed me to to kind of like shed some of that, that woundedness and, and frustrations that I maybe grew up of like having, you know, kind of like racist undertones as, as in my upbringing, like in my youth, but then recognizing that, like, you know, if, you know, a lot of people kind of talk about how, you know, I, like, you know, we, one of our clients is Duke university health system and they have the moments to movement uh, within their own organization and a lot, oftentimes there, there's, you know, and working with some of their leaders that are working around that movement, communicating, like, you know, being able to move from a subconscious level to a conscious level. But, and so I think about that and it's like, well, that's good. But is that like, and I think sometimes some of my friends that I've kind of brought this up with of Christian friends, they're like, well, am I just supposed to brand myself a racist or like, is that what it is the end goal of this, like, of the of the kind of like racial and social justice elements to like I don't really have any of those biases from what I understand or what I perceive to be like in prayer I'm you know as a Christian I'm supposed to love all people but yet kind of like some of this stuff some of the kind of like the me too movement or racial and social justice sometimes just kind of feels like mm -hmm. as like I hate to say it this way but just like a so what like well what do I do with that you know what I mean and and so, yeah, we'd love to hear your kind of your thoughts around that and how you how you tackle the it's really, to me, an issue of the heart and being able to help people to kind of heal through that stuff. Yeah. So that's that's a great question, Chris. And I know you think it's a loaded question, but it's a question we deal with every day in the Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion uh, or some remnants of that question. So. Um, the first thing I would say is that there is a reality that's happening with the changing landscape of our country, right? That the demographic of our country is changing, right? And so that means that um, ready or not, we have to position ourselves from a cultural competence perspective, uh, from an inclusion perspective, uh, to be able to deal with um, different diversity demographics, different dimensions of diversity, because what our country looked like 30 years ago is going to look very, very different 30 years from now, right? Mm -hmm. And um, from, a, from a patient perspective, um, we strive to make sure that, you know, the diversity of our workforce and the diversity of our leadership reflects the diversity of the patients that we serve. And so, there's there's that reality uh, because of that reality. And I heard you talk about uh, the the move, the moment to movement program. And I, I agree, you know, it's not a movement. I mean, it's not a moment. It's a movement. And in some ways, some people would offer it's a mandate. Now, it's not even a moment. It's not even a movement. It should be a mandate because of what we are experiencing in the country right now. So what we've done, and part of my role as chief diversity officer, is to create 
safe places for people to read, reflect, and to acknowledge that there are multiple perspectives in the room. So how do you do that without risk, right? Because if you truly do create that safe space where people can offer their multiple perspectives, then you're really going to get, you know, um, lived experiences like what you just shared with me with your grandfather. And you're going to get some lived experiences of, of people that, you know, may, may find that to be disturbing. Right. Or the best example I can give you is um, in the George Floyd, right after the, the, the killing of George Floyd, we sponsored um, this courageous conversation series in the organization where, you know, just creating those communities of support, channeling that emotion to a productive purpose, but allowing people to bring, you know, the multiple perspectives in their room, if they were in the room, if they were struggling with certain aspects of what happened with George Floyd, we wanted the workplace to be a place where people could talk about it and work themselves through it. And we knew we had to get leaders prepared to lead those discussions because there were some leaders that said, Fernando, I have no clue on how to facilitate that discussion. So, okay. so within 72 hours of his killing, we uh, prepared what we called a racial justice toolkit that had guidelines for how to facilitate those conversations. But to your point earlier, um, when you create those safe spaces where people can challenge their personal assumptions, then you also open the opportunity for them to realize that there may be blind spots there, that there may be um, unconscious bias there. And when you do it in a non-judgmental way, which is it's, it's tough sometimes, right? But when you do it in a non-judgmental way that ties everybody back to a common mission. So at Atrium Health, and I meant to say this at the beginning, Chris, our mission is health, hope, and healing for all. That's our simple mission. You know, that's what everything that we do is grounded in that health, hope, and healing for all, right? So I have to lead with that because that's the tie that binds us at Atrium Health, right? Regardless of our differences, re re regardless of the, of the cognitive diversity, that's my joker, that's my ace that I play whenever we're in, in the room and there's you know different opinions or different perspectives. But if you're successful in creating that safe space, People are willing to challenge their personal assumptions, and they're also willing to acknowledge that um, I may have some blind spots and some biases that I have to work through. So, and, and guess what, Chris? We can't judge people for that, really, because good people have biases, right? There's a, the book by Mazar and Banaji, The Biases of Good People. We all have biases. Right. And if you think about the brain science of where even bias lives in your brain, it leaves it lives in the same place where safety lives, where um, comfort and protection, all of those um, neuroscience elements around safety and protection and what was comfort to you. That's where your biases live. And so. We have to be mindful that helping people work through their blind spots and their biases, you know, are the products of societal norms and things that have built safety for that person, whether good, bad, or indifferent, right? And so we have to get them to a place where they can mitigate some of those biases and understand how to work through those those biases and challenge their um, assumptions on some things, right? So, you know, to your point earlier, I don't really, if you're a leader at Atrium Health, I don't lose sleep over whether you're professing to be an anti-racist or not. Mm -hmm. I know that I hope and pray that you're not, that, that you're not a racist, Right. But I don't lose sleep over whether you say you're anti-racist or not. Where I lose sleep in my role is if as a leader, you don't understand from the seat that you sit in how to contribute to an inclusive culture and how to show up as an inclusive leader 
then that's where we have to work with you. We have to work with you and we have to. And then and I, it's my hopes that in that process and in that journey, you know, some of your own personal assumptions can be redirected. It's, it's hard. Sometimes, Chris, I'm not going to tell you that every day that is, is there's not a challenge in that because a lot of times people are looking for a silver bullet to change, you know, um, some of the things that's in the ground, that's been in the ground for generations and generations, things that have perpetuated structural exclusion, policies, practices, just historical things that have just been in the ground. But now, we're saying as an organization, we're really we're willing to pursue that transformation, that transformative equity, because there's a safe space for you to mm -hmm. say, look, oh, I had this by I didn't realize it. Um, I'm, I, I've got to get to a point as a leader that I can mitigate it, work through it, realize what those decisions, the decisions that I make, how they may be rooted in bias and then work through it. Right. Um, so that's part of my job. The other part of my job has been on from a health equity perspective, realizing that the pandemic has done nothing but exasperated health, health inequities that have already been in place or that have always been in place. And so one of the things I'm proud of is we were able to help Atrium Health identify where those disparities in testing were in early in the pandemic, there were some underserved communities, um, under-resourced communities that couldn't get tested. They didn't have the resources of transportation to get tested. So we did this geosensing heat map um, <clears throat> using technology, and we found out where those communities were, and we mobilized a mobile testing unit, and we went to those communities. We worked with the community leaders, with the pastors, the trusted figures in the communities to say, where do we need to set up so that we can get people tested? And I was proud that within the first couple of months, we were able to eliminate the disparities in testing in Greater Charlotte because we mobilized and went to these uh, communities. So we replicated the same thing with vaccination. We said, you know what, if there's an access issue, if there is a... Um, uh, employment issue, people with resources you can't you can't get to us. We'll come to you, and so we did the same thing with getting people vaccinated, and that helped to lift the equity line in terms of who was vaccinated in the community. So, health equity is is, is a big part of our job. That's where lives make a difference. We're trying to push for equitable outcomes for all, and uh, so that's another piece that we've been working on in, in diversity, equity, inclusion. So. Well, then, yeah, thank you for, for sharing that. Um, getting back to what you were saying is like, you know, the thing that keeps you up at night is as it relates to leaders being able to create an inclusive environment that, you know, reflects back to the mission of Atrium for Health, Hope and Healing for All. Um, thinking about like, can you think about a and obviously doing so in a confidential manner, but can you think of a testimony of where that where someone was able to work through some of that stuff to then have to create the opportunity to have a more inclusive element of their org chart that was really beneficial in that way. Oh, absolutely. So, um, and part of the journey with leaders that I told you that inclusive leadership journey was uh, helping that leader understand how uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion has shaped the representation of their workforce right now, right? So we can, you know, look at the current representation across your workforce and see, you know, how diverse is your leadership level? How diverse is your mid-level leaders, frontline leaders? Uh, how diverse has your hiring been? You know, how diverse has your promotions been? How, how do diverse applicants progress through interviews? in your area. So this is all um, customized information that we sit down with leaders. And I will say, you know, you asked for one example, but I, I will say that um, I've experienced this with several leaders when they actually can look at their information, look at their data and see what the three-year practice has been or when you can see, oh, there could be 
um, an issue with um, selection and hiring? And is, is my process um, equitable? Are we casting a wider net? Are we, are we using diverse interview panels? Um, I've had several leaders uh, just have a, a, a revelation moment um, to say, oh, I didn't realize that, you know, when I use words like culture fit, that um, that was an, an, um, another way to say, you know, I'm hiring based on my biases. Mm -hmm. So, you know, instead of saying culture fit, you know, what about culture add? Why, why, so how is this person adding to the culture that you already have, you know, or how will this person bring a different perspective or contribute to the kind of the diversity on your team? You know, so I've had several leaders to say that to me. And then I will say that um, George Floyd was a pivot uh, or, or, excuse me, a, a tipping point for a lot of leaders. I had one leader in particular who told me that um, because of the courageous conversation, she, and, and she was, I'll be transparent, she was a white female, and she said, because of the tra uh, transparent, excuse me, because of the courageous conversation, I had no clue that Black people had to have a planned conversation with their children around how to behave in front of law enforcement. So she already, she always assumed that the talk was about, um, you know, um, how babies are born, right? You know, that's what a lot of people just assume. But in, in, in some ways, the talk for African-American parents is, how do you behave in the, in the midst of law enforcement? You know, and she said that she had no clue that that, you know, this was a reality for for some African-American families. And and so that that changed her perspective on um, um, the whole notion of Black Lives Matter and and, um, and and why, you know, some people were passionate about, you know, that movement. Now, we never endorsed violence, so we never endorsed, you know, some of the extremist things that we saw, but um, she <clears throat> she definitely had a tipping point and a revelation from the courageous conversations around that. Oh, that's that's excellent. And yeah, thank you for really being able to help me process through and, and our listeners as well to kind of take a look at, you know, how you guys have been being able to tackle the racial and social justice uh, issues in our country, but also to leverage that for the sake of improving the organization and, uh, you know, focusing back into the mission of what you guys are trying to accomplish and how that can better impact uh, both the the patients, uh, the employees, and, and, you know, everyone that interacts with the organization as well. And yeah, I just challenge our listeners that, um, uh, that, you know, if, if, if our conversation today is, uh, you know, just identifying any of those areas within your own heart and within your own life that that there is, you know, opportunities and resources out there available in order to work through some of those biases that that may be coming to the surface. And at the end of the day, the the goal is to love everyone as we love ourselves. <laughs> and uh -huh. and uh, you know, hard to do that when you have those biases. And um but yeah, and I could also see how, you know, as you're saying, like, you know, through this, whether, you know, through the different leaders that you've been working with on how that um, that opens their eyes when they're talking about culture fit or building their teams and being able to, you know, add to the culture within the organization and, and continue to grow in that way. Fernando, I, I realize, like, you know, you, you know, through the time that we kind of budgeted, we've really kind of did a did a deep dive around <laughs> different conversations. But it's, I'm totally comfortable because I think we touched upon some excellent things that needed to be hit upon today. Uh, and we also offered that up in the beginning of the, the call before recording. So, you know, like I always feel like, you know, this show was called in prayer in the first place. And so, like, it's not mine anyway. So I'm just willing to uh, just be a conduit for however the, the spirit of God wants to be able to move, to drive conversations, to helping people to be able to progress in, in living virtuous lives. So and while unfortunately we've not been able to hit upon the, the fear and the hope, mm -hmm. um, I think that what we were able to unpack today was uh, really beautiful and also looking forward to the way that it, it blesses our audience as well. 
Uh, with that being said, Fernando, would love to hear kind of for you, uh, mm-hmm. like what is some of the, what is the biggest challenge in your life presently, whether that be professionally or personally, and love to be able to close us out in prayer. Yeah, wonderful. I'll, I'll give a professional and a, and a personal, if that's okay. Just sure, that's, sure. Um, I feel like this conversation has drawn us even closer together, Chris, and I appreciate um, your willingness to be to to let the conversation move in the way that it was supposed to move and flow in the way it was supposed to flow. So I appreciate you for that. Um, but I would say professionally, I would ask just for, you know, general prayer for our healthcare workers and our healthcare heroes. We come back to call them because the past two and a half, three years have just been a complete challenge for, for people working in healthcare because, you know, our, our processes have changed. Our, our, our ways of, for healthcare delivery have changed. You know, the pandemic has just really re-engineered a lot of that. And, um, and I just each and every day want them to be able to connect back to the meaningful work that they do every day and let that meaningful work be a source of their energy and even their discretionary energy whenever they are, they're tapped out and fatigued. I want them to think about the meaningful work that they do and be just re-energized because they're helping the people in their most vulnerable moments and in the time that they need help the most. So um, I would just offer just a prayer for our healthcare uh, workers and healthcare heroes. Um, and then personally, I, I'm, I'm going to ask or, you know, the challenge for me now is uh, my oldest son. He is actually, um, um, you know, pursuing an opportunity to play basketball at the, at the, mm-hmm. at the um, school that he's at. And uh, because he was a child that graduated during COVID, uh, a lot of his opportunities for exposure were mm-hmm. compromised by canceled games, by, you know, limited season. And so in his freshman year, the opportunity that he thought would come for the school that he's at didn't come. And he could have, I was really worried about his spirit and being defeated and, and you know, him, you know, um, you know, not wanting to be there anymore. But in turn, that circumstance made him work harder. He, he, he kept his grades are right where they need to be, but then he also went to the gym and worked harder and, 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 and he played club basketball and, and that was good for him. He was the MVP of his club team. So like he just really used that year to try to get better. And so now um, he has another opportunity and, you know, I don't necessarily want us to pray that he gets that opportunity, but I just want his hard work uh, to manifest in something good for him. You know, so that's a very selfish. I get that. I'm a dad. <laughs> and sometimes, <laughs> sometimes when you feel like you've done everything you can do as a dad and you can't control the situation, the only thing you can do is just give it to God. Right. And so I, I just want him to know and realize that the way he's handled this situation and his hard work will not be in vain. So I just offer those two things. Sure. So, uh, Father, we um, we lift up uh, both of those intentions, both for, you know, the healthcare heroes and also Fernando's son. Mm-hmm. Lord, you, you said in Romans 8.28 that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to your plan. And, Lord, that... Um, you know, obviously, uh, Fernando has done a, an impeccable job of being able to raise his children up uh, in the word, in your word and and in your truth. And that, Lord, that, um, you know, your will is always so perfect. And oftentimes when we have our have our frustrations or our doubts that we're 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 too close to the situation and not able to see it from your lens. So, Lord. I just continue to pray that uh, that Fernando and his son don't have to ask the question why, but they ask instead what for. And it's from that questioning that we have the ability to uh, raise up and move to a higher level and learn from all of the situations that we're in. And Lord, we also pray for you know every all of the leaders at Atrium Health and. And uh, Lord, uh, all of the all of the clinical staff at Atrium and throughout the industry of 
of that it just has not been an easy season either for the clinicians, you know, dealing with the pandemic or now coming out of the pandemic and, and a lot of the ways that uh, the operating costs have grown immensely and, and, you know, a lot of healthcare leaders have left the industry just due to the, the frustration of trying to, you know, stay within the industry and, and make things work. And so, Lord, we just, we pray that you had said in the Gospels that you make all things new, Lord. And so we thank you for the renewal that you are bringing into the healthcare industry to bring revelation, to transform it from inside and out. So we can, you know, continue to, you know, uh, you know, align ourselves with Jesus's mission to heal the sick. And uh, Lord, we uh, pray all this through your mighty name of our blessed Lord Jesus Christ. Amen, amen, amen. amen. And I thank you, everyone, Fernando, for being with us today. And for those listening today uh, to Fernando's testimony, where we inspire virtuous leadership. And it was a, a blessing to be able to connect with you, brother. And I look forward to continuing the dialogue and building our relationship. Hey, Chris here. Hope you enjoyed this episode. To continue to grow in virtue, will you please subscribe to the Virtuous Heroes podcast on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or Spotify? Or you could also visit us on the web at www.spiritmco.com. That would be tubular. Hope you have an awesome day.